live from Bahrain, it's theCUBE. Covering AWS Summit Bahrain. Brought to you by Amazon Web Services. Hey, welcome back everyone. We're here live in Bahrain for exclusive Amazon coverage. It's theCUBE's first time in the region. We're excited to be here as AWS Public Sector Summit and commercial opportunities are expanding. Amazon has announced and will be up and running in 2019 with a new region here in Bahrain in the Middle East. It will generate a lot of activity. We expect it to create a tsunami of innovation. Data information is the new oil. We're here covering it. This is going to be the beginning of more coverage here in the, in the area for theCUBE. And we're meeting new people, and then we run into some luminaries, CUBE alumni, and our next guest is a CUBE alumni, John Wood, who's the CEO of Telos. Also, been on theCUBE many times, as you might know, expert in cybersecurity. Um, just an overall knowledgeable and visionary entrepreneur. Great to see you, thanks for joining us today. Thanks, John, I really appreciate it. So you're part of the entourage with Teresa, the team, as she comes in and cross-pollinates Amazon Web Services Public Sector Summit, what she's done in Washington, D.C. and beyond here in the region. It's going to be a new formula that Bahrain and the people here have recognized. But we were in a meeting yesterday where you didn't weren't pounding the table, but you looked very clearly at the chief executive officer who reports to the king and the crown prince and said, you don't really know yet what you got. And, and you, you're a visionary, so, and, and we talk about this, so I want to get it out here on camera. This is a big freaking deal. It, it Can is. Can you explain why and what your vision is of what will happen with Amazon? Because you've been a partner of AWS with Telos, you've been very successful. Yep. You've seen the moving parts, you've seen the impact. Yep, absolutely. Of innovation, what's your thoughts? So, you know, the shot heard around the world back at the end of 2013, John, was when uh, the Central Intelligence Agency made the decision that, you know, the cloud was just secure enough for them. And that kind of made everybody around the world stand up and notice. So yesterday when we were talking with all of the various people around economic development in Bahrain, you know, I said, you know, the shot heard around the Middle East is that Amazon is located here in Bahrain. I think, just like what happened in America, it's going to have a, a massive impact from a socioeconomic point of view here in the Middle East and specifically in Bahrain. What are some of the things that you might expect to see um, that they got to be ready for here? Well, first of all, one thing I'll say is a marked difference from America is that the, the government here and the business environment here all has agreed it's important to move to the cloud. That in and of itself is a big, big difference in America. In America, it's been a lot more fragmented, it's taken more time. Yeah. I think here, I think the, 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 the government and industry is seeing the value of the cloud globally, yeah. and they're going to be able to move that much faster than even we did in America. They built a Formula One race track in 14 months. They don't have a lot of the baggage that America has in terms of older systems. And I, don't, I mean more tech baggage. Or tech legacy, older systems, older databases, kind of a clean sheet of paper. They have, they have a bit of a clean sheet of paper, but they also do have legacy, John. What they've also done, though, is they've given themselves a two-year time frame to move everything to the cloud. Now that in and of itself, having a beginning, a middle, and an end, is a really good thing, because the journey's going to be relatively rapid, and I think the uptick economically as a result is going to be rapid as well. So one of the things that you were also involved in here with Teresa and the local Bahrain government and entrepreneurs is you were here with uh, General Keith Alexander who had to leave last night. We had hoped to have him on theCUBE. Um, Four-star general, head of the NSA. He's seen his shares of uh, data and scale. He had a unique perspective. What was some of the things that you and General Alexander were discussing with the government here? Can you share, uh, if appropriate, some of the things you were talking about? I think we can apply best practices here just like we applied back in America. I think the fact that they've gone to a cloud first policy is a really good thing. The next step I think is to, uh, to find a standard that you can actually look to from a security point of view. Because yeah. with that standard you can then have a common lexicon and that common lexicon yeah. allows you to share data between and amongst each other that much more quickly. You know, one of the things I heard you over, over here and I kind of observed this and I'm just going to throw it out there because we think the same way with theCUBE is that when you have a cloud model the benefit of the cloud is you can just actually spin up another instance or things. It's horizontally scalable, generally speaking. So as you run your business Telos with Amazon in the US and other areas, this is a new opportunity for you. It's almost rinse and repeat, just kind of plug in. And cloud gives you that benefit, so this kind of opens up the conversation of opportunities that Amazon will pull with them to Bahrain. 
and the region. Do you agree with that? How do you see this pull I that think, Amazon might have? I think what Amazon can do more than really many other cloud organizations is because they've been at it for such a long time, so much longer than the other cloud providers, they can bring best practices to the table, they can bring best technologies to the table, they can bring best partnerships to the table, which allows people to actually know with, with confidence that if they move to the cloud, it's going to work and it's going to be more secure. The other thing I, I do, will also point out to add to that is that uh, Andy Jassy and Teresa also bring expertise. They'll do, they'll do work here on behalf of the citizens. Well, absolutely. You know, when Amazon makes a commitment to uh, build a region, over a 10 year period, it's anywhere between a two to three billion dollar financial commitment to the region. So that in and of itself drives economic value into the region. So I got to ask you the tough question, which is obviously the one that's an elephant in the room is um, instability of the region, potentially. How does digital disruption impact, say, Bahrain and Middle East? You got the horizon, you got cryptocurrency. We know that market's kind of frothy and, and somewhat unethical in areas. That's a uh, red flag, but wants to be legitimate. Cybersecurity, a big thing. This is your wheelhouse, cybersecurity. These new emerging areas. You got AI booming, you got cloud booming. You got the notion, these emerging tech. Cybersecurity's at the center of the action. What does that mean for the Amazon? What does that mean for stability in the region? What's the impact? What's your view on cybersecurity, Middle East, Bahrain, Amazon? Can you share your, can you unpack that? So John, that's an incredibly broad question, so thank you. So from my point of view, I can't deal with the political situation. What we can deal with is what we can control. And we know we can help control the security automation orchestration. We know it works. We've seen the most security conscious organization in the world adopt the security. You know, we and Amazon are the security for the agency's cloud, and we know that works. As it relates to the political situation, I think here, the ruling party is, understands that's an issue, and they're working on it. And I can just leave that to them. Yeah, and, but you, you're, not, you're independent of that. You allow the scale piece on Amazon. And what do you, what do you hope to do in the region? What are some of your goals uh, as a commercial opportunity with Bahrain, obviously this partnership, at the highest levels, this community here. Young people want to work here. So, I see, I see it as a huge workforce opportunity for everybody, number one. <clears throat> number two, I think we can find a way to make sure that everybody can feel confident that it's going to work. So they can feel confident they can move their workloads to the cloud. People in Kuwait can feel confident. People in Saudi Arabia can feel confident. And again, that confidence builds stability. With stability, with economic yep. stability, there becomes political stability. That's the other point I'll make, is that at the yep. end of the day, if you have the benefit of having the financial stability, it helps in a lot of different ways. So what's your advice to the folks? If I had um, you know, the king sitting here and the crown prince, we had a round table, what were some of the things that you would advise them uh, from your experience, kind of looking back on your career and what you've done now, knowing that the region has got a cultural and more of a different economic dynamic. What's your advice to the crown prince, the king, and folks trying to figure this out? <clears throat> from, a, from a cybersecurity perspective, I would want to do something similar, maybe not the same, but something similar to what the United States government did. When the US government decided to adopt the cybersecurity policy, the so-called cybersecurity executive order, there were two parts to it, John. The first was cloud first, which has been done here. Yep. And the second was to adopt the NIST framework. The NIST framework gave the common lexicon for all the cybersecurity professionals to be able to push their workloads to the cloud. And then guys like me, what we do is we push automation into that framework, which basically means that we get out of the way of the mission and we help make the mission happen much more quickly. What about training and support? What's your impression of the um, Economic Development Board, some of the work that they're doing? Obviously they have a transition. We've heard maybe some of the uh, um, workforce not yet mature, but they got programs in place. How do you see that developing? How would you put them on the progress bar vis-a-vis -vis their aspiration? I think, I think in general, uh, some of the workforce issues that they have here are very similar to the workforce issues we have in America. You know, in America, often when kids graduate from college, there's a gap between what they get in terms of a degree and what we need in terms of the skill sets. That kind of happens everywhere. Yeah. I think that simple programs like apprenticeships, which have been around for a long time, can be very, very effective in terms of narrowing that gap. 
so that when the kids come out, they, we can actually put them to work and they don't have to be retrained in, in the workforce. I think that's a big opportunity. I also think there's a big opportunity to bring some of the people here into America to teach best practices and then bring them back that they can bring those best practices into the environments here so they can have that work themselves here. What's your take on the ecosystem? Obviously here we heard startups are very active, um, but there's a glass ceiling, if you will, because cloud's not yet here in full throttle, capital markets mechanics have not yet formed, but there's a funds of funds that are just putting this in place. Your assessment of the entrepreneurial landscape here. I think it's, it's, it's a small but growing landscape. I think a key point to making uh, an entrepreneurial company successful, you know, we started our company, I started the company back in 1991, which is, you know, many, 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 many moons ago. <laughs> but anyway, what I can remember is, I worked so hard seven days a week. The joke was it was nine to five, yeah. nine a.m. to five a.m. If yeah. you're not here on Saturday, don't bother coming on Sunday. Yeah. So fundamentally, there's a, there's a thing you got to do that, you know, what is it uh, uh, Ben Franklin used to say? It's about 99% perspiration, 1% yeah. inspiration. So hard yeah. work does yeah. help a lot. Not to say that we don't have that, that culture here, but I think in general, no, they were hard working here. entrepreneurial is, is all about making sure you do the work. That, I mean, one of my observations is they're hard working here, so I think that's a good sign. Absolutely. Well, let's go back and talk about this, your experience. You just mentioned 1991. My first startup was 1997, and so we've seen a few cycles. And so, um, you know, as cycles come and go, this one seems to be kind of a, a bigger cycle in the sense of a lot of combining forces going on. You got cloud scale, the role of data, and now AI to automate, uh, and obviously traditional you know, stuff is kind of being moved to a whole other operating model. Given that you've seen so many cycles, what have you learned from those cycles that you could apply here if you were either an entrepreneur here, you're now going to do some business hopefully here, I think in, with Amazon, uh, and for people like in government trying to get out of the way or figure out policy. Given your cycle experience, these guys are jumping into a wave that's coming. I'll definitely, uh, I have definitely have a point of view on this. So for years, uh, back in the United States, uh, I would have one customer, I'd go to this customer, I'd say, hey, this other customer over here, they've done it this way, and this customer would say, I want to do it a different way. And I'm like, well then, everybody's going to be out of sync. Well recently, the CIA decided to publish a case study that talked about moving to the cloud and why they moved to the cloud. And the reason they, they published this case study was for something called reciprocity. I think if more governments, if more industries can work together from the standpoint of reciprocity, then we're going to be able to more quickly ascertain the threat, discover how the, what the vulnerability is, and mitigate it. What specifically the reciprocity should they be working on? Data transfer, information, what are some of the specifics? I think a specific would be the NIST framework as an example. The NIST framework is made up of 1,100 different controls, which are a lots and lots of different subsets of other controls around the world. Yeah. Whether you're talking about ISO, Graham Leach, Wiley, HIPAA, whatever, they're all derivations of a framework, which basically is a common lexicon. So for me, yeah. that's something that is very specific, what I think they should consider here. So one of the things I want to just get your thoughts before we end here is your observations as you look around here, you're seeing a cultural shift. Um, a woman's on the Supreme Court in Bahrain. We went to the women's breakfast that Teresa Carlson held yesterday. Packed house, they had to kick us out of our table. <laughs> they did, guys. they did. We got to make room for the workshop. Great fireside chat with Mary Camarada, head of uh, analysts and corporate communications for Andy and Teresa, fireside chat. Then they had breakouts. We didn't get kicked out, but we were asked to give up the table for the, Politely. For the women to do the workshop. This was a robust, packed house. Not just, so, pa not just packed, John, it was also just, you know, positive, optimistic, happy. They see a future, they see possibilities. There was a lot of give and take. Yeah. I didn't see any of the stuff that you read about. And I'll tell you, this is my first time in the Middle East, my first time to come to Bahrain and I'm so happy I've come, I'm so sad, it took me almost 55 years to make it yeah. happen. Yeah, I feel the same way. I feel like there's an opportunity uh, bubbling that's going to be really big and legit, and I, I love the diversity here, that uh, surprised me. And my, my daughter, my 20, 21 years old, uh, asked me, she said, Dad, can you, what's the, what's the women like over there? Because there's a perception around culture, around the role of women. Packed house yesterday for the Women in Tech breakfast, Inspirational speech by Teresa Carlson. Great workshop here. You see women, a forcing function. Cultural shift. 
cultural shift, but also don't believe everything you read in the paper, right John? Yeah. So we all know that you got to go sometimes to really see what things are like, yeah. and I'm really happy I came. It's, it's, a, it's a bubbling, yeah. growing, active, uh, really active, really cool nightlife, really cool skyline, very beautiful beaches, yeah. it's a great place. The ground truth always trumps fake news and innuendo. <laughs> of course, theCUBE is bringing you all the action. We are here with uh, entrepreneur, visionary, John Wood, also the CEO of Telos, a big strategic partner with Amazon, part of the cultural sea change with AWS. Amazon Web Services announcing a region here in Bahrain in the Middle East. I'm John Furrier. Your CUBE co-host, you can reach me on Twitter, at Furrier, F-U-R-R-I-E-R, -R -E if you want to reach out and ping me on Twitter anytime. More coverage live here in Bahrain, in the Middle East, after this short break.